We made this. Hello and welcome to another edition of the podcast that they refer to as Pick a Disc. I'm your host, Matt Latham, and this is the podcast where someone picks a disc to talk about for whatever reason they want to. And today, the disc picker is me, because it's episode 80, it's a 10 thingy, it's a decade, I don't know what, what is it, not centennial, centennial divided by 10, um, edition of the podcast, so it's a Matt Pick, and hosting this edition is the return of John Porrible from the Play Disc podcast, or the podcast formerly known as Play Disc, or the former Play podcast called play disc um i miss play disc so uh yeah um he's here to talk to me about scatman john's scatman's world yes it is me that's picked it and there are reasons for why i picked it and you're going to find out those reasons if you keep on listening to the podcast and yeah as we do we talk about the album we talk about a lot about um john larkin the man behind scatman john and delve a bit more into just how interesting he actually is um i hope you find information i hope you learn something and about Scatman John in this conversation, because it's quite an interesting conversation we go into. Um, But yeah, and I'm not going to spoil any more about this. Um, So yeah, if you like the podcast and you like what you hear, if you haven't listened to us previously, go back and listen to a couple of the few episodes in the past. You've got quite a few to choose from. Um, So you can go and listen to them. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. Uh, We're on Pick a Disc is the username. And there's also a link to a Discord server as well if you want to join and just talk about what music you're listening to. So yeah. Um, But before you do all that, why not continue listening to this? And I'm going to hit play on the interview where I speak to John. All right. Good morning, Matt. How are you today? I'm good, thank you, John. How are you? (laughs) Not too shabby. We just wrapped up the first week of the new year, and I am back on the podcasting game again. (laughs) Yeah, I'm dragging you out to retirement. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Everybody, yeah. my name is John Porreville. I, I will be your guest host for Pick a Disc today, mm-hmm. the podcast where generally they pick them and Matt talks about it with them. But today, there's a twist. Mm-hmm. So, Matt, you've picked today's disc. I have, yes. And um, before, uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for coming back. I th- working about it, you're, you're the second person to ever... Well, no, let me rephrase that. You're the first person to host a second Matt Pick episode. So uh, congratulations for that. And the the awards in the post, honest. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I just I, I just I did some working out. Well, it wasn't really like working out. The last time you were on this was episode forty, and this is episode eighty. So half the podcast has been and gone <laughs> since you've last been on the on the podcast wow <laughs> we're gonna have to like mark the calendar for 120 whenever that's gonna be and uh, <laughs> i you know if you'd asked me months ago what bare naked ladies and scatman john have in common <laughs> uh but i'm jumping the gun of it matt yeah. uh why don't you tell the good people what disc you've picked for um, this 80th episode of your show yeah, so I've decided to go and pick Scatman's World by Scatman John from 1995, I think it was. 1995. So, it is an unusual album. <laughs> I think a lot of people have heard the lead single, which mm-hmm. was also called Scatman. But I'm not sure that many people, especially among your listenership, will have heard the the album as a whole. Yeah. Yeah, it's... uh. Because I think the reason I want to talk, I think the reason I want to talk about this because I think a lot of people probably don't realise how many one how many albums he's done because it'll probably surprise you. Well, probably won't surprise you, but surprise some of you. Two that Scatman John or John Larkin, as his name is, is that there's a, there's a very there's a very kind of inspirational a lot uh, story behind him. He's a lot more interesting than people will probably ever get credit for, and also quite tragic as well and we'll get into that a bit later on but quite in the lead up to this i was i was kind of watching a few things and a lot of people on like on youtube videos and online commentary all kind of end the same in that they were very surprised at what they found out about him and 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 like and every every youtube video every uh article i've read about this is um usually ends with a kind of bittersweet 
kind of optimism but also sadness as well and we'll get into that a bit why as well and but yeah i've i've always found this quite interesting i don't it's not an all-time favorite it's not one i'll put in my tier in my tier so this is probably the first album in a map pick that's not either a top or a middle tier um i've always liked it and i don't think it's great there are, i don't think it's great it's it's good but it's more interesting i think than and it's almost guilty pleasureist that I don't mind listening to it, but there's always there's, there's flaws in it that I find more interesting than anything, and I'm quite interested to kind of have the opportunity to say why this album's never left my head for about so many years. Yeah, this is very of a piece of the rubric we used to use when I hosted my podcast, Play Disc. You know, I was always in search of albums that not necessarily were like all-time favorites, although some were, uh, but I was also equally interested in, in things that were interesting failures or or that had flaws but still stood out as unique and uh you don't get much more unique than mr scatman john larkin here he's uh one of a kind he is yeah Um, so how did you uh how did you discover this uh this artist and and in particular the album uh the album's separate story but i can't remember the first time you hear heard scatman uh, Scatman John, but um, I don't remember the exact moment because I think I was probably so I was ten in two thousand. No, I was ten in nineteen ninety five. So I would have been about nine, and it probably was either on the radio or kind of uh, the TV when they showed stuff on, showed stuff. Um, but I do remember that. Things I do remember is that um, ninety five Christmas ninety five was the first year I got a CD player. Uh-huh. And I got two compilation discs, like the greatest hits of 90, 95. Yeah, the greatest hits of 95 and hits 96, which was, they always put next year's um, year on, even though all the songs were from 95. Um, and I think on the greatest hits 95, they had uh, the title track. Well, not the title track, but um, Scatman's <laughs> give it a bit I'm just going to call it the Scatman. Um, they had that on there and... I think it was one of those that just like as it was because it was like the only music that I had. It was, it was one that often got played um, mm-hmm. throughout, and so yeah, so it's always been in kind of back of my head. And jumping ahead um, into the actual album, um, so I think more or less just started getting broadband, discovered the concepts of cough, torrent cough, um, and for some <laughs> reason, for some reason, I. I, 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 and this might have been around the birth of YouTube or something. I was just looking at weird, like, one-hit wonders and stuff or, like, weird tracks. And I wanted, oh, I wonder if any, I wonder if there have been any other albums or by these artists and stuff. And the existence of, kind of, where you could download, <clears throat> cough, uh, entire discographies of BitTorrent. You, you might need there. to get one of those uh, at-home tests, Matt. Are you okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cough. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's, I've got the... Uh, the Kazaro and uh, no, I, I tried to think of a massive pun on <laughs> file sharing sites and Corona or COVID, but um, I can't find, think one. Um, feel free to <laughs> suggest any if you can think of any. Um, yeah, so basically, I was I, I was kind of like looking at these kind of like one, one hit wonders or kind of people that you only knew one or two songs from, and go and then finding massive amounts of massive amounts of disc, in their discography. Um, mm. Yeah, the biggest surprise, and I won't go, in, I won't go too much into why, but um, Chumba Wumba, uh, the song Tub Thumping, oh, yeah. Tub, Tub Thumping, um, blew my mind when the complete discography was in the 30 gig range, <laughs> and, <laughs> and that they'd been around for like two, in 1982, so I ended up, ended up downloading all of that discography, and mm-hmm. um, then... Not fully understand, not fully understanding all the political stuff at that time because I was thinking I was in my early twenties at that point. I didn't really know anything. I'm um, still don't know, don't know anything now, but I'm not more aware of it. Um, so <laughs> I think I left with I left that whole discography with just one song, um, which was Time Bomb as well as Tudumper. But um, okay, but I did the same with a few other things. I can't remember, I can't remember what other acts I did. I think it was like the Crash Test Dummies was one of them, where I found out they had a few albums, um, but. And the one that surprised me was Scatman John. So I thought, oh, okay, he's he's got a couple of other ones. And then um, then loaded them. And I didn't listen to the any of these other albums, but this is the one that I kind of like ended up listening to. And I was like, there's something interesting in this. 
and then it's just always been in the back of my mind or and like occasionally or just if, if if i can't think of what to pick i'll just whack this on or sometimes if i shuffle my mp3s or shuffle my mp3s occasionally a song from this album would come on and stuff and it's just always kind of been there and yeah and i'm I'm not like it's not like someone I'd listen to loads, but occasionally be like, oh yeah, that album exists, and it, as part of like <laughs> cheese factor, I'd listen to it. Oh, interesting. I um, so if so, just to be clear, so you hadn't even listened to any of his other albums, uh, even to this date. Um, no, I've, I think I listened to bits and pieces of his other stuff, but I never really kind of listened okay. to any of them because like um, and I, I couldn't. I I think I couldn't remember why, and I listened to well, probably briefly talk about them a bit later on near the end but um yeah i had listened to I think everybody jam was his next one um which i briefly had a quick listen to but never really stuck with and then he had a third one which was take your time which i th- must have li- i must have listened to at some point but the last time but the last time i remember listening to it was yesterday in the last minute revision for this okay. <laughs> so uh but yeah but this is the one that stuck did you, by any chance, listen to his uh, self-titled jazz album, the one from 1986, John Larkin? No, no, I'm not. I'm okay. not listening to that. But uh... yeah, I mean, it's it's very um, it's contemporary jazz, so it's it's uh, a little inaccessible unless you're uh, unless you're a fan of that genre already. <laughs> mm-hmm. But like, you'd never guess that in less than a decade's time, he would become one of the biggest novelty stars in the world. <laughs> I'll go ahead and interject with with my history here a little bit. Um, yeah, but yeah. So you and I we're we're similar in age, right? Uh, yeah. You, so you were you said you were about nine when when the song was new. Yeah. Um, this is one of those ones. Sometimes it happens that there's like some cultural phenomenon, and you just completely co- miss out coincidentally. Just <laughs> I didn't hear it when it was new. I don't know how because uh, I understand it was a it was a chart smash on both sides of the uh, of the Atlantic. I understand it was a chart smash on both sides of the Atlantic, but somehow uh, didn't manage to cross my radar uh, until probably the early aughts. Like I think it might have been 2009 or 2010, the first time I heard it, and it stopped me in my tracks. Uh, and when I say heard it, I, I do mean uh, the song, I'm the Scat Man, Ski Bop 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 Bop, not yeah. the, uh, the full album at this point. So the first time I heard that song, I had a misconception. I, I don't know if this is common. I'm curious if you had this. That uh, I thought that some 90s DJ had taken an older jazz recording, some extant recording by an older artist, and just kind of done the the techno remix thing that was so popular in the 90s that you just take it, some existing source material, chop it up, edit it, put a drum machine and some synths under it, and call it a techno mm-hmm. remix. Um, and I'll tell you what, if you've ever seen the music video for that song, that does absolutely nothing to dissuade that opinion because John Larkin is a man out of time. Uh, (laughs) in the video, he's shot in all in black and white. He is the unlikeliest pop star who ever pop starred. He, uh, (laughs) he's, he, at the time of the recording, he was 53 years old. He had, uh, like a whisk broom mustache. He wore a bowler hat. Uh, he looked like. Thompson and Thompson from Tintin. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, he does. <laughs> and in the music video, he's all letter. He's he's in boxes in in like picture in picture boxes all throughout the screen. So it really did give the impression that he was a pr- a previous artist. That this was like a repurposed recording from the sixties or seventies or something. And it wasn't until much later I realized that no, he he record he wrote and recorded this song for purpose as the version we're hearing, uh, which is really it's cool and interesting, and it and it puts the scatting, which is obviously it's the the main attraction of the song and the album, really puts that in a different context because it's a compelling sound to listen to, uh, and I think it becomes even a little bit more compelling when you realize that he is doing that sound more or less live, that it's not, uh, you know, in the, in the recording, he's, he is being assisted by some studio like overdubbing and, uh, and editing, but it's not there. This is not the work of a DJ taking an earlier recording and making it sound like that. It's they're helping him. uh, His production team is helping him, 
realize what he's already what he's already performing. <laughs> in other mm-hmm. words, uh, I like I don't want to be disingenuous and say that this is like live in the studio because there is definitely some uh, some editing and overdubbing in the recording. But like. He's doing this as an instrument uh, with the intention of doing it in these pop techno slash even maybe from a weird angle rap ish songs. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's. it's Interesting again. This word "interesting" is going to be the thing. Is that um, it's our watch so, word? So yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know if actually. In fact, I'm pretty sure you might have mentioned this YouTube series to me in the past. Um, I think Todd in the Shadows does a one hit Wonderland mm-hmm. series. I th- I think you might have mentioned it in the past. I think to me a while ago. I think, but um, one of the episodes he talks about the scat uh scatman song and he and one of the things he's mentioning is is that it's crazy how you've got what is like a jazz scatting technique mixed uh-huh. with the kind of euro dance from the 90s mm-hmm. um where you've got a very regimented repetitive repetitive like almost in time never yeah 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 kind of yeah kind of kind of songs that would go on for like they could go on for hours and hours and hours, and you've got yeah. and you've got almost the original improvis improvis the original improvisation. Oh god, I can't pronounce it. The original <laughs> improv because um, I can't say the, the end of that word. Um, the original improv of like music in like the jazz game and stuff, where you've got a kind of free flowing yeah. kind of like you can just. It's almost like a guitar style, but with the voice and stuff. And exactly, yeah. yeah. And that and that kind of technique comes to play in a couple of the songs in the album later on. But yeah, and it's a very interesting kind of mix of kind of like genres um, where you've got the kind of Eurodance, you've got this kind of original thing, and it it fits re- quite, fits quite well. It's like um, it's like when Run DMC and Aerosmith suddenly yeah did Walk This Way, and everyone was like. Wait, like rock and rap work really well. I think as a yeah, but then again, rap Two gets great in, tastes that taste great together. Yeah, it's a it's the uh, I, I'm pretty sure I've used this I, I've used this to, I've used this on the podcast before. There's a there's a a cutaway on Family Guy where two cars crash. Someone was eating peanut butter. Someone was eating chocolate, and because <laughs> they put peanut on my chocolate, they put chocolate on my peanut butter, and the policeman who just is there kills them both and nicks the peanut butter. And, makes peanut butter, <laughs> chocolate peanut butter chocolate and stuff but um yeah it's one of those weird things where it kind of mixes but then rap gets in play into it as well pop gets in played gets put into it as well and it just seemingly it's like a weird alchemy of stuff that sounds cheesy but works and yeah and it's just it's just weird how they manage how, they, how it all just come together yeah definitely um and you mentioned Todd in the Shadows. I did want to shout him out because, like, I would not have gone and listened to the full album had it not been for One Hit Wonderland and Todd in the Shadows. Um, I mean, frankly, One Hit Wonderland was one of the biggest inspirations behind my podcast. <laughs> I I thought, man, if I could take that level of of like deep dive and and uh, and discussion and and uh, like I don't have I don't feel like doing a YouTube series, but uh, I could totally bring that into podcast form and that was yeah. one of the one of the chief inspirations behind behind me starting my own show uh mm-hmm. <laughs> and albums like scatman's world uh we never got it we never got to talk about it on play disc although i'm sure we would have at some point um uh, absolute perfect fodder for this because it's it's sort of an people know who he is people know who scatman john is because the the <clears throat> the song scatman was uh was huge a lot of people know it and it kind of became an internet meme in uh later in its life uh, but a lot of people don't know the story behind it and behind the man um and it's a fun thing to share it's a fun thing to get excited about especially if mm. once you dig in you might you might think you'd be forgiven for thinking oh well if i listen to the album it's just going to be more of the same and it's going to kind of suck and I mean, it's not a perfect album, but I think he's got a lot more going on for him than uh, than you might expect from the novelty single. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So. All right. Um, so we we uh, 
typically at this point we transition to talking about the history of the band and the art or band or art. <laughs> typically at this point in the show we'd start talking about the history of the band or artist and uh, some of the album release information. Uh, we have already covered some of that stuff, um, but uh, just to get some of the stuff out of the way here, this is uh, uh, John Larkin, uh, also known as Scatman John, uh, was a uh, a jazz musician. He was. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, he had, uh, you know, gone through the ranks of the contemporary jazz world as a pianist and sometimes vocalist. Uh, but this was his first pop album. I, I keep calling it pop. I, I, I really don't know what to say in terms of genre because this is sort of in a class all its own. I think, he, yeah, I think he, I think he could argue it's pop because the sound at the time. I think I don't know what it was like in the uh, I don't know what it was like in the US in the early noughties in terms of mm-hmm. dominating guitar charts and stuff, but Euro dance and that kind of like <clears throat> mm-hmm. kind of dance was like massive in was like dominating the charts in the early nineties in the UK. Um yeah. and one yeah, so like you had kind of uh Doctor Alban, you had the CNC Music Factory, you had Two Unlimited, mm-hmm. you had all that kind of like uh <laughs> Corona for who did Rhythm of the Night. Um, for <clears throat> all yeah, of those had chart yeah. success here in the states as well. Um, but yeah, so, but that, that kind of sound was there, so you could argue it was pop. But it was that kind of Euro- it was that kind of like European dance sound that was just really big and popular. Um, I'm trying. Th- it was kind of like when it's like in about. 10 year in about 10 years time is like when the guitar revival like the post punk kind of indie guitar revival will come in it was like a like a long drawn out phase i think um i think actually you know brick pop probably brick pop suddenly suddenly kicking in which probably knocked that off um so yeah so brick pop came in in like the mid 90s and probably stopped um well, perhaps around the same time as this so it probably stopped like kind of the the dominance of uh, Euro pop, um, with Euro dance more or less. Um, but yeah, it was kind of that kind of weird, kind of popular thing at the moment. We kind of, it was. I think it's the case of well, okay, we've had this thing for so many years. How can we twist and how can we adapt on it? And you and and um, there have been kind of, and throughout like the, like the early nineties, late eighties, they've been doing kind of Euro dance remixes of different songs and stuff and I my mind's gone blank now but that Todd in the Shadows episode on this gave a few examples and I'm like I didn't realise they were original songs they were covers mm-hmm. of songs or new versions of songs where you had yeah. like kind of 80 soul classics suddenly mm-hmm. given a backbeat um, backbeat of like synths and kind of like synth bass and the kind of processed drums and stuff and it's and it was like a Prob- massive success <laughs> yeah probably my favourite of those is Cotton Eye Joe uh, <laughs> <laughs> for Rednecks like that was an old like an old bluegrass standard and now it's better known as a as a dance pop or techno song so uh, um, yeah um again I, I i didn't i didn't go too much into i don't think i ever went into the the deep dive of rednecks but um it came up on some kind of podcast not sure a while it, ago not sure if it would have been worth your time to do that yeah but um <laughs> yeah but like if you look at some of the other singles around that time um, they are exactly the same as Cotton Eye Joe. There's yeah. a song called Poppin' an Oak, and if you find the if you find the YouTube video for Poppin' an Oak, you'll see so many people taking the piss out of um, Redneck saying, "Oh, I'm so glad they went in a different direction from Cotton Eye Joe for the next single." <laughs> <laughs> sort of like uh, you know, bringing it back into contemporary milieu when uh, Lil Nas X had Old Town Road, and then. Uh, I don't blame him for not wanting this to be his next single, but it was the one after his next single was Rodeo. (laughs) (laughs) Which is like, okay, that's a... In my opinion, Rodeo is a genuinely good song, probably the best on that EP, but you can't put that out right after Old Town Road. That's no... like. (laughs) Okay, anyway. Yeah. That is neither here nor there. In 1995, after two, three decades of uh, John Larkin cutting his teeth in the contemporary jazz scene. Uh, He abruptly pivoted to this project of being the Scat Man. He adopted a new moniker, Scat Man John, and uh, released a single, Scat Man, open paren, ski bop 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 bop, close paren. (laughs) And then subsequently this album, which is called Scat Man's World. Uh, And it's 
a bit of a loose concept album too, which is one of the reasons it holds together and and uh, kind of rises above the novelty. Sorry, Scatman's World, the album, came out in July 10th, uh, 1995, uh, and it was his first album under the name Scatman John, uh, which is the stage name he continued to use uh, until the end of his life. So in a way, it's sort of a debut. It's sort of a re-debut or a, or a reboot of his career, uh, and certainly the version of his career that most that, that he had the most financial and commercial success with. Uh, so... Let's let's get into the actual songs here. Uh, outside of that one lead single, uh, Scatman's World is a bit of an odd bird. Uh, and <laughs> as we've discussed, I mean, he has this instrument, which is he's a piano player. I don't know if there's any real piano on this album at all. Uh, it looks like I it think, sounds like it's keyboards or at least. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's an actual keyboard in it. It all seems to be like either like processed synth sounds or probably stuff from keyboards yeah there are and i'm not finding album credits uh anywhere here so it's not clear to me uh, what instrumentation is being used uh, there are some there are i think two or three songs on this album that have a quote-unquote piano on them but i i'm pretty sure it's a uh <clears throat> like yamaha keyboard patch or something like that um from how it sounds or if it is a real piano it's processed beyond recognition <laughs> um and it's not clear whether uh whether uh, John Larkin is playing those keyboards, or if he left all of that to the production team of, uh, of I might be mispronouncing this, but Catania Music, who did, um, who did the producing, and it's a- Antonio Nunzio Catania, uh, who actually has a co-writing credit on every song here, probably because of all the instrumentation, which is, I don't want to sound disparaging, but the instrumentation on this album is mostly just bog standard '90s dance pop what used to be called techno uh and i mean if you if i tell you imagine a techno song yeah it's, you're gonna it's, be it's, you're it's, gonna be yeah or one of my favorites is uh say the word boots and then say the word cats boots cats boots cats <laughs> um but you know if you picture just the stereotypical 90s techno you're not going to be too far off the mark for a lot of these songs um and you know there's a that does sound pejorative but again i enjoy this album so i'm not yeah. i'm not saying that to knock it but he does dress it up in this concept he has this um two of the songs on this album directly reference an imaginary land called scatland mm-hmm. and i think it's indirectly referenced in a couple of the other tracks as well let's just get this out of the way we're not early in the podcast anymore but let's just get this out of the way before we start talking about it scat has multiple meanings <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to uh you know when i was in eighth grade my i had a a um, social studies teacher we were talking about uh human evolution and so um my teacher back then knew that she was teaching a bunch of 13 and 14 year old students who were going to make a lot of hay out of the names of some of these uh, hominids that we were talking about. So she was like, get it out your systems early. The first time she's like, okay, we're going to meet the homos. We're going to start talking about the homos and the class giggled. And she's like, get it out of your system because I want you to be desensitized to these words by the time we get really into it. Homo, homo habilis, homo, homo erectus. <laughs> like, and the class went into hysterics, but it worked. She was like, she just used the phrase so much that it stopped. It stopped meaning that thing. Um, so I, I feel that way about Scatland. Like, okay, let let's. <sighs> it doesn't mean poop land, guys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's just get that out of the way. Uh, <laughs> but, um, he talks about Scatland, which is this. Indirectly, it's what he means by Scatman's world. You know, it's it's this kind of fantasy land that he retreats to and it's probably the most interesting thing about this album is that his his visualization of what scatland is what it means to him is very telling of his concerns as a person his psychological concerns in particular um i don't want to do like armchair diagnosis or something but he is the impression that I get as a listener uh, is that he has developed and retreats into this kind of fantasy world as a uh, as something of a 
escape or or defense mechanism or something. Some of the lyrics make it clear uh, that he's had some trauma in his life. Um, a little bit even on that lead single, Scatman, but but very much so in Scatman's world, Quiet Desperation, and uh, later on Song of Scatland, which is like the big, mm. um, the 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 one really tender ballad uh, near the end of this album. Uh, what did you what did you make of all this, Matt? Was this was this one of the stronger impressions of the album for you as well? The concept behind it, yeah, because I think because when because when you read into I think um, Scatman John's um, story as well is that he's, he seems to come from a place of okay, we've got these troubles and we need to find a way to get over these troubles and stuff. And yeah. I think the one thing the one thing we haven't talked about yet, um, mm. I think which you might have to probably have to reference. Uh, probably talk about uh, before we carry on is that um because he, he came into he came into his kind of pop career very late in his life um very late in his life um and i think but well, i think get the impression that he always kind of wanted to be a kind of showman or a leading like a lead singer mm-hmm. but he could he couldn't because he suffered from like a really bad stammer um mm-hmm. And like he's just, and like you, you'll see if you look on YouTube, there's interviews with him where he does still he, he drops into a he drops into like a nat, in, well natural stutter, he drops into a stutter, um, and he kind of like has a very uh, and he seems to kind of just embrace it. And he talks about the fact that and it, it's it's literally in like quite quite a lot in the album that mm-hmm. um, he that when he was younger he was he discovered that he was able to kind of use that stutter to go into scatting and to be able mm-hmm. to develop to develop the skill and in, so in, so he took one of his kind of disabilities and embraced it embraced it and made it into something that defined his life and defined his life and made it his cheat kind of his the thing he was known for and yeah. and he embraced it and it it led to, it led to him being quite successful and quite successful in places and uh we'll talk about it a bit later on but also in japan um also in japan <laughs> that's a whole other story i can't wait to talk about that um but yeah so but yeah so so when it comes to scotland scotland and um scotland and scotland's world or the land of uh, scotland as the kind of concept and stuff i think he kind of, i think he might have this idea that there's like an idealistic world that we can achieve if if you kind of like see what's wrong and then find out how to tackle that and then become a better person out of it. And if everyone in the planet does that, then the world will be a much better place. And uh, I can't think of a better terminology. We all send to Scatland, which is kind of weird, kind of weird thing to say and stuff. But there is kind of this imaginary (laughs) kind of end goal that he kind of envisions kind of recovery from whatever trauma and stuff. Um, I I, I can't, I've not been able to find much, about it um the only reference i really could find was in the genius notations for a later song that were later song um uh, where apparently he was he did take drugs and stuff but i couldn't find any confirmation on that but then it does seem um that suggestion does some does crop up a couple of times in the lyrics where it might be okay he might definitely might have tried had substance abuse issues in the past and stuff but um but yeah he kind of t- took this disability embraced it i was going to say not let him define him but it kind of does but he then uses it to say okay if you have this disability or you find yourself stuttering or stammering and stuff then you can kind of embrace it or find ways around it and stuff and um whilst and whilst at the time and whilst it, it didn't really apply to me afterwards when i was much younger i used to have them i used to stuttered like crazy um i used to have i don't think it was like a full-blown like dying that stammer but i had issues like particularly confidence issues and stuff and um i i know i do notice occasionally when i'm editing that i will repeat very similar phrases more than once um whilst talking on this podcast um god god knows how, god knows how no one's called me out on it yet but um yeah i do feel that's like a knock-on effect on when i used to have that kind of stutter when i was younger and it's kind of and so it's kind of like it is kind of like one of the key parts of how inspiring it is that he kind of had that and took it and and well and this was born <laughs> yeah um you know one key lyric you know from the from the the 
it's it's hard to talk about some of the songs because there's a title track Scatman's World and then there's the the song Scatman <laughs> mm-hmm. which is the lead single song but one key lyric from that lead single uh, is uh, everybody stutters one way or the other so check out my message to you so um and later on in the same song everybody's saying that the Scatman stutters but doesn't ever stutter when he sings uh but what you don't know I'm going to tell you right now that the stutter and the scat is the same thing so he had a severe, like, I, I guess would like, I guess it'd be like considered a clinically significant stammer mm-hmm. that he, that affected his regular speech patterns. It's not uncommon for people who stutter or stammer uh, to, to not show that stutter or stammer if they are singing uh, or in, in some cases rapping, I guess, <laughs> or reading some pre-written material like that. Uh, there's some aspect of the performance that kind of bypasses whatever mechanism is blocked in the stammer. But um, so that's not all that unusual. But what is wh- what's really interesting in, in John Larkin's case is that he take took this 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 inability to get the words out where he and he turns it to ski and he goes he goes extremely fast faster than i could faster than you could uh largely by taking this quirk of speech that is in a lot of ways considered a disability but then just leaning into it and making these interesting sounds with his mouth the clinical aspect of this stammer that interrupts his speech definitely affected his life it, it's not really clear from from public record about just how bad that was but it's clear he's been through some form of trauma he had some confidence issues he had some um some inability to uh, to deal and it's uh you know my understanding is that he he was reluctant to even take on a vocalist position in his jazz music uh because of that stammer and um uh, I think it was his wife kind of convinced him to try it anyway. And, uh, and he got some good critical reception. So he put out a whole jazz album with, with some vocal stylings on it as well as keyboard. And then eventually became this, this leading man of, a uh, or, of, uh, and then eventually became this solo pop act. The other key lyric in this album that I wanted to highlight is from song of Scatland, uh, near the end. Uh, the society of Scatland is composed of, very loving, caring people who have never even heard of political corruption, class distinction, war, and all the other stuff that goes on in the world of the Earth people. Which, like, for me, that it's telling in its in the way he's framing it. Like, these are the problems that he is concerned with in our earthly existence, so he invents a world where these problems don't exist. Um, and it... It's kind of like it's kind of like Coheed and Cambria, but <laughs> you're <our> dance <laughs> jazz. Yes, yes, it's exactly like Coheed and Cambria. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I looked. I by the way, I mentioned. I wanted to mention this earlier. I, I looked this up. Uh, Scatman John is not the oldest person ever to have a uh, a first appearance on. Uh, the billboard chart, but he is like, I think third place, something like that. It, it's very unusual for a man of his age to break into the chart for the first time. Um, and, uh, you know, if I had been him, I, I would, I, I wouldn't blame him for going this far into life and expecting that it would never happen. Uh, so it's really cool just to sort of see, I think he, by the time he recorded the rest of the album, I think he had a taste of, of what the success of that lead single had brought him. And I think it shows through in some of the lyrics, especially, uh, in songs like, uh, only you sing now pop star. Um, and, uh, you know, he seems pretty excited at the prospect of being, famous in uh, you know for for being the scat man uh but but he has a bit of a uh, sort of sardonic distance from it as well that i think keeps him feeling keeps him seeming humble and grounded yeah there's um again going back to todd in the shadows he, he described him as a kind of cartoon character which he kind of is i mean the scat man john is this so you've got like kind of john larkin so you've got John Larkin and you've got Scatman John. And I feel there's 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 a, a, a great self-awareness. There's a great self-awareness. And like, I think part, I think, and you get the impression that he's quite enjoying being able to do what he's doing as Scatman John in the, fa- in the, in the kind of guise that we're seeing him in. Um, 
and the guys that we've seen him in. Um, and that he's able to kind of be fun, but then kind of process and perhaps do talk about or perform about things that he's perhaps always wanted to kind of explore in the kind of like slightly darker, kind of like darker aspects of his life or darker aspects of his of the world and stuff and he kind of enjoys being able to do that and mixing it up and he, he leaves with this kind of interesting weird tonal mishmash um which sometimes doesn't hit properly i don't think but you kind of have to give him points for effort because it it just i mean like yeah I, for example i think the quiet desperation is about homelessness yeah <laughs> it's about homelessness and Again. It might be the best song on this album, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> like as a song. <laughs> yeah, it's it's again it's 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 kind of like the if you wanted the gritty reboot of Scatman John. <laughs> yeah, it's the Chris it's the Chris, it's, I mean if you've got if you had like Scatman's World and you've got Scatman and then you wanted you got Christopher Nolan to do a kind of gritty reboot, then <laughs> this is the quite desperation aspect of it. But the with that song, because um, I'm assuming we've, I'm assuming because we've naturally moved on to talking about the songs anyway. Um, sure. Yeah, the that song I find is quite interesting. That he starts talking about our world again, um, cause, and I'm assuming part of it is to do with kind of like in Scotland this would not have happened. But it doesn't really reference Scotland exactly. in that one, but it kind of talks about what's happening here and stuff and um, lyrics that are. Very oddly relevant in 2022. Um, there's a oh bit where gosh. yeah, uh, hasn't aged a day. No, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> for example, the second part of the first verse is the guy in the Mercedes just ho- hollered with the dollar. Better grab it because the signal's turning green. And while you're at it, put the jug behind the picket fence because the cop, cop that's driving by for sure looking mean. Uh, institution contribution restitution destitution doesn't mean anything to you now. You're the freeway feature for your audience to driving by, so you should stand up and take a bow. It's for one, it's for one, it's kind of like taking a slight jab at institutionals. It talks about talks about kind of like police corruption. Um, I mean, I saw that line because the cop that's driving by show looking me. I was like, bloody neck. But then again, evergreen. Yeah. yeah. But then, yeah, and I think I think one of the things that's perhaps being highlighted between twenty in twenty twenty was I think was I think perhaps highlighting more thing highlighting f- for a global audience that the things that were happening in 2020 aren't isolated 2020 it's been happening for for years you want to talk about like and then you look for uh, nwa um what they've been talking about talk about uh is it rodney king was it the rodney king riots and that kind mm-hmm. yeah rodney king i mean there the the correct answer is there were many but yeah you're the one you're probably thinking of is rodney king yeah yeah, yeah. and that and those kind of things that are happening before this album came out um yeah, and it's still oddly relevant in terms of, well, in terms of all the uh, things it's talking about earlier in that song. Uh, the, Lordy, do I wish it weren't? But yeah, yeah. it's true. Like, uh, a plastic bag is all you got to show, and your books inside your shopping cart is probably the best education you're ever going to know. Um, again, criticizing the education system and um, very straight, very oddly progressive, and very kind of almost left wing. <laughs> very yeah, left-wing. I mean, yeah. I'll say I, I think he is. I think he he would embrace being called left wing. Um, you know, this also comes up in uh, Scatman's World, uh, not the album, but the the track two on this album. Um, if part of your solution isn't ending the pollution, then I don't want to hear your stories told. <laughs> like this is a guy who's really concerned with with what we now consider either leftist causes. Some people say liberal, although that has kind of two meet two conflicting meanings sometimes. But uh, you know, the kind of guy Rush Limbaugh would have made fun of, you know, for being a <laughs> for being a, a Guardian read like Guardian a, reading lefty, which uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. A, a bleeding heart is one of the yeah. one of phrases we we use a lot here in the in the U.S. Like uh, he cares about the homeless. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of shifting into my limbo impersonation. Oh, he wants to fe- he wants to house the homeless. What is he a communist? Like you know, that's not <laughs> maybe a little, uh, <laughs> but he's concerned with this. He's concerned with climate change. He's concerned with poverty. He's concerned with. Uh, with just general treatment of your fellow human beings. Like I'm sure he resents having been subjected to trauma in his own life. Mm -hmm. uh, And that gives him a great deal of sympathy, which I I think is a good quality. I mean, you say, you say probably not communist, but 
There's <laughs> the closest thing to communism in this album is the start of the second verse, and Scat, uh, Scat, uh, I, Scatman's World is like top of uh, like one of the top of my kind of guilty pleasure songs. I love mm-hmm. this song. I unashamedly mm-hmm. love this song. In fact, so much I don't think it's guilty pleasure. There's just something so cheesily pop about it. But the second verse starts with um, everybody's born to compete how he chooses, but how can someone win if winning means that someone loses? Yep. Which basically is capitalism. <laughs> basically, capitalism. Yeah. And like, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's like, 100%. that's like, again, I, I'm, my, my knowledge of communism isn't, communism isn't that great, but I'm assuming, but if anyone wants like to inform me where like, because my idea of communism, everyone, everyone is, everyone is equal. And mm-hmm. that's probably the closest thing you've got to that kind of almost like, if not communism, socialist, is that the right word? I'm not sure. But there's definitely, there's definitely, there's definitely a kind of anti-capitalist sentiment Oh yeah, yeah. in that. Which, uh, yeah, uh, I could if you allow me to kind of really set the record straight on like the political spectrum, but like that's way beyond the scope of this discussion. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I don't think we need to focus ourselves with that. But I think anti-capitalist is is definitely an apt descriptor. Like a lot of the, uh, he is concerned with wealth distribution, and it is, and wealth distribution is a, a contributing factor to a lot of the other things that he is also concerned with uh, in the lyrics to this album. Oh yeah, um, and again, same chorus, uh, same verse. Uh, source of my intention isn't really isn't crime prevention. My intention is prevention of the lie. Welcome to Scatman's world, where mm-hmm. it's it's again, particularly when you go back to his kind of like almost. Cri- I mean, he, do, he doesn't really reference anything else about um, police. I think for the rest of the album, apart from that one line. But um, yeah, again, he's part part of me is wondering that. If he was still with us now, particularly what's happening in the world, I I generally think he'd probably be he. I think that he would probably be doing something a, a lot more overt and mm. and direct along those kind if of he, lines. If he had survived into twenty twenty, it wouldn't surprise me to hear that he turned out the best album of his career in 2021 like based on based on just current political system like uh, he would he would have been due for a career revival based on just the zeitgeist uh unfortunately he was not um we'll we'll talk about that in a a little bit more probably very soon but there's one other song i wanted to highlight uh which which is the song pop star um (laughs) because this is another song where like I really first of all it's fun it's a toe tapper but it's also um, it's an example of how sometimes the lyrics don't uh, don't stand on their own very well like this you mentioned the album has flaws and uh, you know Popstar kind of shows some of them like his descriptions of Popstar the the premise of Popstar is very similar to um, what's that what's that guy's name uh, the, life's been good to me so far um, hmm uh, hang on one second I'm just going to look it up and then be able to Joe Walsh. Duh. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the premise of the song, it's not that it's not that dissimilar to uh, life's been good to me so far by Joe Walsh, where he's taking the persona of like an over the top celebrity who, who goes, you know, who, who, uh, it just lives this ridiculous over the top party lifestyle. Um, and, the lyrics are just an exaggerated version of like a pop star escapades. It's got some fun wordplay in it. The thing that really strikes me about this song is that he is such a sincere person that he can't even go the whole song without dropping the veil and saying explicitly in the lyrics, everything up to this point in the song has been a joke. <laughs> like he had like on the one hand, it's like he doesn't trust us to get the satire, but on the other hand, it's just, it's, it's how sincere he is <clears throat> that hang on one second uh pulling up the lyrics right now i think yeah i i, th- I think i know what you mean um because it also got perhaps the sequel to Le- too legit to quit into yes. <laughs> too too hot to flop <laughs> <laughs> too hot to flop. Too hot to flop. Which Look is like, this, yeah, it is a spherical, spherical sub- successor to Too Legit to Quit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So after two and a half verses of him just bragging about how awesome he is and how extravagant his lifestyle is, the the lyric. This is not paraphrasing. I'm quoting him. Everything you've heard me say so far is a joke. An open mind and sense of humor is our only hope. 
<laughs> so it's like he can't even sustain that level of satire for an entire mm. song. He is he's just a a naturally sincere person. And like on the one hand, that's kind of a dig. I, I get that again. This is another thing where it's sort of a backhanded compliment, and I, I recognize that. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it's really sweet. I, I think it's his personality. You know, I'm kind of talking myself into a point that I hadn't considered before, but one of the most amazing things about this album is that when you become a major label pop star, it is so difficult to keep any aspect of yourself in the music and scatman john completely succeeded in that like this is his personality his vision his artistic and emotional concerns are are all over this album uh and uh you know it's that's a feat that is really amazing and it's one of the reasons that i like it when this genre uh, very often does not appeal to me it's because he was able to make this something that is that that is not just a product for sale although it is that too uh but it's also uh, a, a unique expression of his unique artistic point of view. I think this is this is almost like the precursor to how Eminem would dip between Slim Shady, Marshall Mathers, Eminem, um, mm, but on a lot yeah, more, yeah. on a lot more um, like complex level. Um, I'm not going. I'm not going to divulge this because I I could literally talk for hours about Eminem, Eminem's first like half of his <laughs> career. So, but mm-hmm. I mean, um, I'm going to say, for example, if you look at the song Eight Mile. Eight Mile is the song. No, it's not Eight Mile. Uh, lose yourself. Sorry. Uh, lose from yourself. The, yeah. yeah. Lose yourself. So, and I, I, I never fully realised until about ten, fifteen years after that song came out that the third verse is Eminem and not mm. Be Rabbit because the yep. first, the first two songs are pretty much almost in character or about the song and stuff. But then he actually, mm-hmm. the third one, he kind of he does similar to what, he, what Scott Majon does here and kind of takes himself out of the kind of world that's been building and he goes uh and i i know i i know it is in the in the rhyming section of the second one i didn't realize he actually explicitly references mckay pfeiffer in yep. the actual lyrics of that and i'm like <laughs> and the first time i noticed that i was like what? and it blew my mind about how that, that the whole third verse and like how the hell have i heard this song for about a thousand times and not realized that he that third verse but any kind of like disassociates and kind of mm-hmm. critiques the thing and i suddenly realized oh, crap that's Okay, that song is that's been seen as one of the best rap songs ever has suddenly just gotten better for me. Um, yep, <laughs> this is no, this is probably nowhere near the lose yourself in terms of quality, but I can appreciate that there's almost something. And uh, people who can't see this, I, my, my hands are being way, I'm waving my hands about like crazy trying to make this point. Um, <laughs> gesticulating, yeah, I'm, yeah, articulating my words are gesticulating. Um, but yeah, so yeah, he kind of separates himself and say, like, yeah, okay, what I'm just saying is. Like kind of a character, um, but he doesn't articulate it as perhaps as well or as mm-hmm. in time or as as cleverly as Eminem does in Lose Yourself when he kind of deconstructs yeah. his own. He deconstructs the the almost the Will Smith soundtrack stereotype. Um, yep. But um, it's, it's the same as well because I think because there's a I do quite like some of the kind of like little kind of fun moments in the first verse where he goes, my life's so upgraded, my ego's so inflated, I'll become an X-rated fantasy, which yeah. when you look into actually who John Larkin was as a person, right, that's probably the most... Very much up- not true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, like, it, it, it doesn't even feel like it's Scatman John, the character singing this either. Um, it's Scatman John, the character, because I think, because we're getting this impression that Scatman John is kind of an extension of Larkin himself, in that he kind of, he's like this kind of pacifist, kind of almost utopia-dreaming kind of like everyone is yeah. equal every single person is equal kind of thing so when he starts talking about this it's not clear who's who this is supposed to be and stuff and if it does feel kind of out of place in terms of the themes of the other songs particularly when particularly mm-hmm. when you if, if we are if we move to the song afterwards which is time take your time which which um i've seen online where he, this is the song where he kind of talks about where he talks about potential substance additions, where, again, again, I don't want to get into it, and one day I'm going to talk about the Eminem show, and by proxy, the first of the Eminem albums in that, in that, uh, I'm, going to try and, I'm, not, I'm not going to, I'm trying to make this quick, Um, with Eminem, he's got Eminem, Slim Shady, and, Mar- and Marshall Mathers, who are three different kind of distinct personalities, and people that he's managed to craft, and then those three albums are, those three albums are kind of, 
focused on those aspects of him. Um, I think with this song, Take Your Time, I feel is the song where it's not Scatman John, it's John Larkin. So it's not so it's not Eminem, it's Marshall Mathers. So this is and this is the one where I this is the one where I've seen the odd few notations talking about perhaps this is about his um substance abuse and stuff. And for example, you see me crawling in again, reeking of the same gin. Um and acceptance is the page and is answer page four four nine. I d I, I don't know if that's an explicit reference or something because I couldn't find anything referencing four nine nine, but the idea but I've seen people make idea kind of raise the idea that perhaps it's like, I don't know, an instruction manual for like Alcoholics Anonymous or something or um, or something like that because that because the song is about kind of like take your time, take one day at a time of like trying to get through something and it's the closest thing to John Larkin I think we have on the album and it's one of, one of the highlights as well for me, mm-hmm. that song. Ta- uh, one Day at a Time is uh, one of the mottos of... Uh of Alcoholics Anonymous and, and uh, some 12 step programs. Uh, right. So is that's the first, it's also the first step of the 12 step program is accepting uh, that there is a higher power, um, God or a higher power. It's not specifically religious, but you, you, um, but that's probably what acceptance is the answer is a reference to. I, I can't help you with page four, four, nine. I don't know what that is. Um, yeah, I, I wonder couldn't... if maybe there's a Gideon's Bible or, or something like that, that has, mm a relatively specific or um I, I wonder if maybe it's like a gideon's bible or king john's bible that or geez i can't believe i said that wrong twice <laughs> i think i wonder if he's referring to a gideon's bible or a king james version of the bible where there's some relatively standard pagination uh but i, I don't know exactly what that is but there's definitely references in the lyrics to time take your time uh to the 12 step program uh, so yeah yeah Every morning hit your knees, 90 minutes, 90 meetings, 90 days. Heard you share, yeah. we care. Check it out, Tommy. Take a time, take a time. Again, that's yeah, anonymous. Those are meetings. <laughs> those are meetings, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And again, this is, uh-huh. yeah. But it, it's also, I think this is like just past the halfway point. And I think this is the point where I think the album kind of starts to kind of run out of ideas um, in the song surrounding it. But this is kind of stuck in the middle. And this has this weird particularly in the time in the mid 90s where you'll have this kind of like almost lower register almost minor key kind of dance track that has this kind of like that if you've if you've nodded off or kind of phased out this is the one that kind of induces or carries on that kind of haze and this has that kind of like disassociated disassociative quality to it that i think a lot of albums had at that time where they'll just sign that kind of weird album tracking but and it has that, but then I think it's one of those that rewards a re-listen because when you start to actually think about it, you re- it does start doing those things like I mentioned earlier in that you've realised that this isn't a character, this isn't the cartoon, this is the man behind everything, kind of talking, not as frank, not as frankly as perhaps, a bit, not as frank as perhaps um, other artists would do later on, but yeah, this is him kind of being able to discuss or a hint to perhaps those traumas that you was talking about earlier. Uh, but again, but then he, this comes in like what? Right after pop star. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, yeah, a, a it's a, it's a very tonal, it's a tonal left turn with you, where you can pretty much like almost handbrake turn for the album yeah. stuff. And then that's it, a really good point. Do you happen to know? I mean, this would have been the time it would have been released on vinyl. Uh, Cause CDs were not, were still not quite ubiquitous yet. Uh, this might have been the turn. This might have been the side break, right? From uh, Pop Star to Time Take Your Time. It's it's right around the halfway point of the album. Potentially, but um, but yeah, I don't know if it, I don't know if it was released on vinyl. It probably was CD. I think CDs were dominant in the mid nineties, particularly over here anyway. But um, but afterwards, afterwards you've got Mambo Jambo, which is oh yeah. Yeah, which again is like another tonal shift, but this is, and considering what's happened before, this is like a weird kind of mix, but it's one of the first ones I think that feels like it's the the run of ideas or they've, okay, then we've, we don't know what to talk, we don't know what to talk <laughs> about anymore. Let's just do some improv, improvisation, improvisational scatting 
And Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I just looked it up and I totally nailed that. Pop Star is the last song on side A of the vinyl release. Oh, OK. Fair <laughs> enough. That is you flip it over and there it is. OK, sorry. Go ahead. But yeah, <laughs> but yes. And then he finally follows up with um, Jambo Mambo, Mambo Jambo. And it feels like they've kind of run out of ideas and they're just dipping mm. to, OK, start just doing the improvisational stuff. And again, with this and another, another song that's afterwards, I wouldn't be surprised if this was something that he kind of made up in the recording booth. I mm, think maybe mm. I had a slightly different take on Mambo Jumbo, which is that it's not necessarily running out of ideas, but it's also that, you know, music as a, as a career and as a, and as a, an album, not every song needs to be a statement. Sometimes it is just the joy of performing in and of itself. And I felt like Mambo Jumbo was like, boy, I need to do one. That's just music for the fun of music. Like that was where I, that was the place I thought that song was coming from. Uh, okay. Because yeah, it doesn't have much in the way of lyrics. It doesn't have a story. It doesn't. It doesn't have an obvious connection to the concept of the album. But it is just an expression of. Uh, it's a it's a bit of a genre experiment, um, but it's also just a fun, joyous e- explosion of a song. Hmm. Uh, not my favorite on the album. I, I don't blame you for, <laughs> for discussing it in that context of, of being out of ideas. But like. It's it's a different mode. He's shifting into a different mode by this point in the album. Yeah, definitely. Um, in terms of reception, I mean, the song Scatman got, was a massive chart success. Um, not so much in, in my native United States. It, uh, it, it cracked the top 100, but it peaked at 60. Uh, it did a lot better overseas. Uh, hit number one in multiple countries. Uh, the album did okay, but uh, he put out two more singles. Neither was uh, neither was as successful. I mean, obviously. Um, <laughs> but uh, and then uh, he kept on trucking. <laughs> he was able to put out. Do you remember, Matt? Was it three more albums after this? I think it was two. It was. Uh, okay. Yeah, there was two. But but the and, uh, uh, this is a guy who like he knew he was never gonna be the biggest rock star in the world, but he did have some degree of success and he held on to it for all it was worth right up until you want to, do you want to take over the biography portion here? Um, yeah, I think the only thing I want to probably mention as well is that, um, it, it, it did okay. I think, um, he got to number one in Finland, but the bit I want to bring up, which I think leads to kind of where he went, in terms of his career afterwards, um, is that it sold over one and a half million copies in Japan. And uh, to this day, <clears throat> to this day in, uh, where is it? It is still one of the best-selling albums of all time in Japan. Yeah, he's right up there with the Beatles and Mariah <laughs> Carey and, and Scatman John right there on that list. I think he's, what, number 20? Yeah, uh, hang on. <laughs> right, right between, like he's up there with Michael Jackson in Japan. It's it's astounding to me. I can't be, like you look at the list and you're like, one of these things is not like the others. <laughs> one of the biggest international stars in Japan was Scatman John, and he just found like a massive resurgence, like a surge in popularity, and he was everywhere. He was absolutely everywhere in Japan. Um. So yeah, and it's it's I can't I'm trying to think of a of a British analog, um, but I I can't I can't think of one on top of my head, but yeah, um, if 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 he if he's if he hadn't if he unfortunately hadn't died um, when he did, I think he'd still be massive because they just loved him. He was everywhere. <laughs> um. But yeah, so he, he, and then I think, cause, but based on that, I think he was, t- I don't know whether, I can't remember where he was, but I think he collapsed on stage. He collapsed on stage and was diagnosed with um, lung cancer. Um, and then he, and I think a couple of months later, um, he passed away, I think in November of 1999. So. Um, he tried to keep working through the diagnosis. Like this yeah. is a guy who's like, I finally achieved my dream of, of, 
achieving commercial success through my art and he didn't want to let it go and I, it's so hard to blame him for that and he was always kind of like very kind of focused on trying to help others or trying to encourage people to be happy and be their best self and stuff and and he was he was just a shame that he that he he, start, he found his calling late in life. He and you see clips of him in Japan performing and doing all stuff. He looks like he's enjoying it. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. He looks like he's enjoying himself. He's having, he's, he's kind of reached a level that he's uncomfortable with. Um, and again, yeah, it does. It kind of yeah, it's cartoon character, but it's there's a self awareness there that there's self awareness there that he's fully aware of and. It was just a shame that he was cut short, just as he was in the mid, in the prime of his of his imperial yeah. phase. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of his yeah in in his artistic re- renaissance. Yeah, yeah. It's so you know it's so funny. We're talking about Scatman John and his origin from having this stammer. I am so hyper aware of every time I trip over a word during this episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly, I'm not, yeah. not. I swear, I'm not making fun of him. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, like who knows where he would have gone? Uh, I, I, I do maintain he would have continued making music or at least tried to, uh, for as long as he could, for as long as he could make a career out of it. Yeah. And I do maintain that if he were still with us today, he would have put out something quite trenchant sometime in the last two years. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm definitely, I'm yeah. pretty confident on both of those facts. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's a real pity. Uh, yes, yeah. there's nobody else like quite like Scatman John Larkin. And um, this album will always hold a place in my heart because of that. It's very compelling. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and exactly. Yeah. And there's just you can't help but just feel kind of like slightly inspired when you hear the story around him. So. All right. You do have two follow up questions. I don't think either of these is applicable today. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't suppose you ever saw Scatman John live. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, where else to go in their discography? I mean, we already talked about the the other two albums, Everybody Jam and Take Your Time. Mm. Um, yeah. You, I, which you're not even that familiar with, right? No, I think I'm familiar, I'm familiar a bit with Everybody Jam because that was the lead single, lead single right. from my um, second album where he, mm-hmm. where he has a... Uh, kind of virtual duet with Louis Armstrong um, That's and, right. and the video is filmed in New Orleans and stuff and it's it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a really good song it's actually a really good song actually it's just the, yeah, it the rest of the album doesn't really hold up and when I listened to Take Your Time which I think was the I think it was released post posthumous after his death um, <laughs> you're doing the whole Porky Pig thing here yeah <laughs> uh, I, I just can't pronounce words today Um I think it was really you know, his funny enough, I'll, I'll I'll square the circle on this one because the 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 way I learned the word you're trying to say posthumously or posthumous yeah. is from the album Maroon. Oh right, from because because Stephen Page sings it in the last track on that album. Uh, Tonight is the night I fell asleep at the wheel. Uh, I'm just a posthumous part of the scene. Oh, I had never heard that word before. Yeah, posthumous. Yeah, it was. Uh, I want yeah. to say 13 years old, 14 years old, maybe. I'd never heard that word before, and that's how I learned it. So, hearkening back to my previous guest host stint on this very podcast. Like half the, half the <laughs> podcast to go. Half the podcast to go. go. Yeah. But the, um, yeah, but the, I think Take Your Time, I think it's kind of weird as well, because there's a lot of kind of other vocalists doing all the choruses, and so they've got all these kind of female vocalists, vocalists doing all the choruses mm-hmm. and the breaks and stuff, and I don't know the situation around that and everything, but it, it, don't know, it just feels so different to this album this album feels like it's its own you know kind of unique slice of Scatman John that he's not yeah he's not looked into you really get a feel for who he is yeah or at least who his his performing persona is (laughs) wonderful well I'll go ahead and uh, I'll give the wheel back to you Matt Um, yeah I I tried to be careful with the old girl I I only hit a few mailboxes on the way Uh, (laughs) Yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'll, 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 I'll send you the invoice for the work. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, okay. Getting control back. So here we go. I need to remember how to do the hosting bit now. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, we come to the end of the of the eightieth episode. I mean, bloody hell, eighty! Wow, the hundredth episodes this year. 
I can't believe I'm getting to episode 100. I can't believe that. Um, which is about November time, and it's. I'm. Uh, I won't lie. I'm a little envious. Like I had dreams of what we were going to do when Playdisc hit 100 episodes. Uh, never, <laughs> never realized. So episode yeah. episode 100 it, was the first album I wrote down on the spreadsheet. So oh. before the first one, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to hit a target. I can't wait. I'm going to hit a target. I want to talk about this album on episode 100, and it's going to it's going to be the motivation I'm going to get to try and do 100 episodes. And I think well, it's working. I think it's good. I think it's working so far. So, um, you, but yeah, it's so. it's a it's an amazing achievement. Congratulations. Yeah, but I think that'll be November time. So. Uh, um, I could easily give, <laughs> I could give up before then, but um, anyway. Um, but yeah, that's in the future. We're going to go back to the present, which is... Yes. And the conversation that we're having now, which is uh, the song for the playlist. Now, for people who have not listened to this before, what this is, is that I'm going to be asking John to pick one song from this album to be immortalised forever on the Spotify or Spotify Hall of Fame playlist. I can't veto, the, I can't veto it. And um, the choice is his. And I'm going to ask John, John, which song do you think you're going to add to this? Matt, I have six words for you. Mm-hmm. Ski, bop, bop, bada, up, bop. <laughs> so, yeah. This was this was not a difficult call. Like there are good songs on this album. There are songs that are, uh, that are, sort of revealing more of what Scatman John does. But if I'm picking one for the playlist to represent this album for all for all of history on your Spotify list, it has to be Scatman. Ski, bop, bop, bada, bop. Like there's no, as, as an opening statement, as an artist, you know, as a, this is who I am song, you can't do better. It's, it's a great example of the scatting as an instrument. So it's, it's a really good performance of the bab part. Uh, but it is also the lyrics have this mission statement of like why he is, why he does what he does uh, and why it's important to him. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I can't, and it and it's it does all this while being an absolute bop like total like it slaps so hard <laughs> i never get tired of listening to it and um you know that's that's a rare thing in this world so uh, that's our song so yeah so scatman ski bop 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 is going to be the 80th song that goes upon probably the 80th 79th well it's going to be, it's going to be representing episode 80 which which means it will follow the double bill of Seven Wonders by Fleetwood Mac and previous last week's epi- last episode of Jesus of Suburbia by Green Day. <laughs> nice. Oh, so, yeah. can't wait to hear that album. That or, or, I can't wait to hear that episode. <laughs> so yeah, Harrison so. and I, when we thought we were going to continue play disc, we were debating which, if any, Green Day album to cover. He he definitely wanted to do American Idiot, uh, and I wanted to do one of the lesser known ones, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. can't wait to hear your take on that yeah so he's from the the long nine minute jesus of suburbia into scatman <laughs> let me ask you yeah so jesus of suburbia very obviously surpasses the latham limit mm-hmm. i is it an exception though i mean i think it re- remains extremely compelling the whole time what did you think I, I i guess i just need to wait for the green day episode but uh, yeah um, yeah spoil it for me <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, never it's mind. been a few weeks since I've recorded the episode, but um, but uh, yeah. So um, so that's so we're going to go from Jesus of Suburbia to Scatman John to um, the the uh, album that's going to be. I'm not going to spoil it. Um, I will tell John after recorded. But the it's going to be an interesting. It's an interesting few mix episodes coming up for the playlist. I think, um, especially when this you go from this to what's coming next episode. But um, yeah, so with that, um, with that, we've reached the end of the conversation. And John, it's so glad to chat with you again after all this time. Um, oh yeah, nice to have yeah. A catch up and catching up with an old friend. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, people want to find you and your songwriting works. Where can they find you? Uh, first place I send people is to my Bandcamp page. That's uh, John Porabil at Bandcamp, or not at Bandcamp. <laughs> That's at johnporabil.bandcamp.com. Uh, my name, my given name is spelled without an H, so it's J-O-N, and my surname is P-O-R-O-B-I-L. So type that in John Porabil at... Uh, <laughs> So type that in johnporabil.bandcamp.com. I also have 
a SoundCloud and a YouTube page, uh, both under my own name if you just type in the searches on those uh, platforms. Uh, and my most recent album at, at the time of recording remains uh, the one that came out at the end of 2020. It's called Stages, and it is available on Spotify and Pandora and Am- Apple Music and Amazon Music and all I, all these other, uh, wherever you get your music, uh, you'll be able to find that there. And I hope to have some, th- some other new stuff for you by the end of this year. Oh, cool, cool. I'm looking forward to That's one of my New Year's that. resolutions. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to that. So, um, I've been hard at work on some tracks lately. So, Oh, cool, cool. And with that, we've reached the end. And, and I just want to say thank you ever so much for coming on, John. Oh, thank you for having me. This is... I. I missed this. <laughs> You've been listening to Pick a Disc and I've been your host, Matthew Layman. Our theme music is Pump by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Pick a Disc is hosted by the We Made This Podcast Network and you can find them on www.spreaker.com slash user slash We Made This. You can find the Pick a Disc show site on www.spreaker.com slash show slash Pick a Disc. You can find us on all the usual social media type places like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter under Pick A Disc. You can also email us on pickadisc at gmail.com. Until next time, happy listening to all those discs that you are picking. Goodbye. Hello everyone, this is Tony, Network Chief of We Made This. As you know, our podcast network brings together a brilliant assortment of talent who talk about all kinds of pop culture content, such as the episode you've just listened to, or maybe you're just about to listen to. We're not going anywhere, but we'd love to keep the lights on for even longer if you're able to support our network on Patreon. For just £2 a month, you get your name in lights and the satisfaction of knowing you're helping us produce more great audio. And for £3 a month, you'll get your name in lights, but you'll also get access to an exclusive bi-monthly podcast from the We Made This Talent Pool on podcasting, pop culture, and, well, you tell us. We'll take your suggestions. For less than the price of a coffee per month, you can help keep We Made This going. Just head to patreon.com forward slash we made this. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash we made this. And get the ball rolling. Now, back to your scheduled programming. Elsewhere on We Made This. Red and buried. I think that with this podcast, we get to explore all the different types of, of things that exist within crime. Yes. And the genre. The only rule being it has to be in the book. Yeah. Yeah. The literary equivalent of fast food. And I love fast food. Well, there you go. Exactly. And yeah, it's kind of a crime within a crime and a book within a book. A and murder? A murder. Oh. Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast. And I think what it actually does is simple, silly, short and on brand and fits Red Dwarf. But critically, because it is an advert, it's actually effective. I got the message that it is a better idea to use the app technology over a phone call to the AA. And that's surely the job done, right? Yeah. 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 I didn't think it was like roll on the floor funny, but I didn't think it was unfunny. I thought Chris Barry's performance of he was ringing. It reminded me a lot of the old bank adverts you used to get where someone would be like, oh, you're with that new bank. Well, I'm with so-and-so bank and I can ring. I'm sure that there were adverts like (laughs) Brian Laurie that used to do that back in the day or Harry Enfield. The Barclay card adverts with Johnny England. That's it. Yes. Yes. Movie bursaries. How old were you when you sort of came across Mulholland Drive? You've been pretty young, I would have thought. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have. I watched it two days ago, but I haven't seen it since I was about 17 or 18. Mm. And I think the only reason I got onto that is because I was a film snob, but also <laughs> because of the band uh, Rammstein. <laughs> right, they had, um, was it the song Rammstein in Lost Highway? Uh, the, the song Ramstein was in, yep, in, in Lost High, correct? But they also did a music video for some song, I can't remember what it was. But it was like a burning of a car, and I remember that I watched the making of, and they just kept talking about it being Lynchian. Uh, and I was like, what does that mean? Check out all of these shows and more on the We Made This podcast network.